Thank you both, Emily and Ariella, for two uh, really fantastic and rich papers. Um, also papers which I think are so knitted together in, in, in many important ways. Um, Emily, when you were talking, I was so struck by, by your, your, um, your concept of, of the transaction as something that erases violence, and which then came to me, it seemed to me that that was very much repeated when Ariella was talking um, about the way in which likewise the transaction of sale is what kind of liquefies um, the violence of an object once it enters the museum. So in both cases it seems like the idea of the transaction is so important because it's, it, in your case, um, the transaction erases uh, you know, the violence of rape uh, through legal means. Uh, likewise, you know, with the art object, it's also a transaction of sale uh, that then erases the violence of the original context of the object. But it also seems that in addition to the transaction of sale, it can also be the transaction of research. So for instance, I'm thinking of a case like the body of Sarki Bowman, which was kept in the, in, in the Paris museums for so long as an object of research. And so it seems that that kind of transaction of research in a way can function similar to the way that a, a transaction of sale can, uh, can work. So I was, I was struck by that. And of course, I was also struck, and correct me if I'm wrong or misunderstanding, but the way in which um, the objectification of the woman's body that you spoke of, um, the way in which the, the black woman's body um, it's, it's impossible uh, for the kind of legal structure, uh, the racist legal imagination to see her as a subject and insist on seeing her as an object. That in a way seems paralleled by the objectification um, of the body of um, the man who was photographed um, by Agassi in, in the Harvard archives. And in both cases, there's that shift from subject to object that happens. And so that, it was then really interesting when your paper returned at the end to doing that reverse shift of, of, of rendering the so-called object of the man back into a subject um, through, through you know, trying to re restore um, subjectivity and subjecthood to him. So that, I guess the idea of the transaction as this kind of violent transformation um, was, was one thing that I saw tying the papers together. The other thing that um, I was really struck by with Ariella's paper was the idea of, of errata and erasure. That came through to me, um, particularly in the document that you showed where the government of Palestine is literally crossed out and, and Medinat Israel is put on top of it. Um, and so I began, and so I guess the erasure for me also um, you know, on the one hand, visually, it's a way of kind of visually imagining these processes of potential reversibility that, uh, you know, is, is so central to your paper. And I think also potentially implied in yours, because it seems like the process of action and denial that you were discussing still hasn't in any way been, not only been reversed, but even been acknowledged. Um, and so it seemed like um, the idea of, um, you know, acknowledgement is obviously extremely important, but um, the idea of the era and potentially as a kind of icon of, back, of, of reversing the flow of movement. So in the image of the procession, the image of halting that you showed in the image of potential reversibility, I think just really um, you know, embodies a whole kind of radical epistemology of of, of kind of utopian possibility that I think is, is very distinct and runs against, you know, a very, very long tradition. And I don't exactly know where this tradition shifts, but the tradition that says what is done cannot be undone, that, you know, we get from Macbeth, seems to me certainly to be reversed, for instance, with someone like Hannah Arendt who says what has been done can be undone. And for, for Arendt, uh, you know, the vehicle of undoing is forgiveness. Um, although for her, <coughs> only certain things can be subject to, to, to that process. Whereas for Derrida, he also argues that 
uh, forgiveness is, un is the vehicle of undoing, but for him, he insists that only the unforgivable can be forgiven. So, you know, both of those seem to me kind of philosophical parallels in some ways to, to the teleological thrust of history that in a way needs to be stopped. Um, and the image of the procession as a kind of forward march of history, I think is such a, you know, a potent image of that. Um, but, you know, I, I guess the question that I would really wonder about or, or pose to you is this question of potential reversibility and the role of acknowledgement, um, which can be articulated in a document as a potential beginning for further kinds of actions of reversibility. And that when one potentially rejects the framework of the documents and the language of rights, whether there is still space for those very documents to produce potential acknowledgement or, or whether that is something that is sort of beyond, um, that is not useful anymore. <laughs> Um, thank you for your comment, Leora. I think that um, just with respect to the, okay, um, with respect to just the tail end of what you said about kind of the possibility of of usefulness in the document. I found myself so struck by your comments, Ariella, about refusing the archive. Um, and I wondered about how, because, because so much attention has been placed in my field on, on achingly recovering within the archive. And so I think there, which, you, you know, which, is, which is something that we're in conversation about, I think, in the context of these two papers. And so the kind of um, work of someone like Marisa Fuentes, who's, who's, who's um, insistent on a kind of grueling process of repair, knowing it will always be incomplete, but nonetheless turning to it. And it strikes me as, and, and that comes from this long history of, you know, we have to, we have to rewrite this past. So your paper um, strikes me as a, a total turn in a way that is really exciting and also terrifying as a historian to say, to refuse the archive, right? And so anyway, the, this question of, um, remainder or use that you're turning to is one that I was thinking about as well, wanting to dive into this kind of sense of refusal. And I love your invocation, Ariella, of the effects are obvious. <laughs> we don't need to go into the Imperial Archive to find them. We have nothing to prove. And yet also the return and the return and the return of saying, can we read else, el uh, elsewhere or like, can we read against the stuff that is there? Um, can we engage in critique of the space and of the thing and of, and of the document? So I don't know. I, your, your work sort of seems to draw, throw some of that into some of the some of the existing crisis of Atlantic slavery's archives uh, arrives in a new crisis. I think in the work that that you've articulated. So I thank you for that, and I'm just. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, uh, Leora and uh, uh, Emily, for these comments. Uh, I don't know, there is so much <laughs> uh, in the question and in the comment or the, the other question. Uh, I will try. Uh, I would like to start with something. Uh, Leora, when you uh, read my uh, bio, short bio that I sent you, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, it's the first time that I listened to the name of a book that I uh, wrote several years ago, From Palestine to Israel. And I remember how much I had to work out this you know, title to make Palestine present. But when I listened to you, I really wanted immediately to go home, even though I promised myself I'm not writing in the coming month. But I wanted to go home and to write a sekel, which is from uh, Israel to Palestine. So even this title bothered me now and requires an errata. Because it, coming back, Emily, to your question, this title is still with a kind of commitment to be a rigorous scholar, because chronologically it was from Palestine to Israel. 
Uh, and I think that, and in this sense, I think that there is so much in the work that we are doing that is a constant errata. And what I'm trying to question, and uh, I admit I'm trying to challenge historians, uh, uh, I'm trying to challenge historians, but not alone, with many others who challenge them, but I'm trying to push to the extreme, actually, the work that many of us are doing. We find the archives completely suspect, but we are still committed to this rigorosity that is document-based uh, research. Uh, not all of us, I don't want to speak in the name of all of us. So what I'm trying to do is, first of all, I'm using scissors, I'm using pens, I'm using brushes, I'm turning out documents. They cannot be respectful on my desk. And uh, when I saw the image that Amar Lanier sent me, you know, after reading uh, uh, Sadi Artman review of uh, Delia's Tear, and not only this, so many other texts, there are things that you can, I cannot show this image again. I showed it many years ago when I tried to understand something else, but I cannot show it. But with errata, it's something else. There is an errata there. She disregards our Harvard claims to property, right? And she uh, distorts the image in their terms by the way that she uses it and cover it with her words, which is a uh, counter-imperial temporality that is still enslaved. So, I, so what I'm trying to do in my uh, way to challenge the archive and to think about reversibility, not only as a philosophical question, but as a practice, is uh, uh, there are certain questions for which we should deliberately and overtly and aloud and in course say that for these questions we are not going to the archive. And Marisa Fuentes work is amazing, but she's not going there to justify reparations. So I think that, but there are questions for which we should not go to the archive. It should be, and this is what we uh, wrote you know, in our invitation for this conference, once we acknowledge these crimes, let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Rather than, okay, let's have the conversation without assuming that all these crimes uh, took place. So it's really, the, the question is not only to see the possibility that Palestine is not the name of an enemy, it's not the name of these two enclaves that one day will be a state, but Palestine is exactly where Israel is. And this can take years to realize, but once we realize it, the entire ontoepistemological apparatus in which we operate should be transformed. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's open it up for questions. I just, uh, you know, the, the comment that of course occurs to me is that when you were talking about the practice of errata and using pencils and scissors, your practice is seems to, in a way, verge more on a practice of art than a practice of history in the way that, you know, error is so accepted and embraced within art practice as being indispensable to process, whereas in history, I think there's a slightly different uh, view of it. Um, but some of the ways in which you're treating the material, um, you know, almost verges on yeah. that. Say one thing, but this is exactly not what I'm trying to. This is exactly not where I want to place myself. I don't, I'm not an artist, and I don't want to be an artist. I want to intervene in the uh, apparatuses of uh, production of scholarship. So even though I'm using, uh, you know, some uh, uh, artistic means or procedures, etc., it is not in order to be uh, to become an artist. For me, for example, covering, you know, parts of these images, I don't want to go to the archive and that people will show me this is an image of slavery. This is not an image of slavery. This is an image of enslavers exercising violence. So only spending few years just to identify in those images the weapons. And finally, weapon is oftentimes the document. Not that, it doesn't mean that it is only the document, but try, and trying to associate the document as the document that then we are going to consult in the archive. Questions? Comments? <laughs> um, Emily, I have a question for you which is, I was so convinced by um, your pivot between the race of violence and the gender of violence. But I wonder what the stakes are in terms of calling it the gender of violence versus the sex of violence. 
um, because if there's a really specific way in which consent functions in this particular kind of violence. And it's not quite the same, it's not only transactional, right? And so, you know, thinking as a feminist theorist, what would shift if you were to actually make that commitment? And in a lot of ways, I think it actually amplifies and sharpens your argument um, in terms of what the transaction is and what role, more than the tracks, that transaction consent plays in nullifying violence. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of want to push that farther and to take up the specificity of your argument in relationship to race um, and to think about the, the role of, you know, identifying, you know, something we don't talk about, like the sex of violence necessarily. Um, so that's just an offering. Other questions? Um, thank you both for those extraordinary papers. Um, I had a question for each of you. Um, for Ayala, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about overdetermination um, and the ways in which I think what you're so helpfully helping me see through this idea of errata and retro perspective is um, undoing the work of overdetermination, that um, it will have been that Palestine becomes Israel. You're interrupting in a particular kind of way, but I'm just wondering if there's um, something about the overdetermined that help, that, or if there's some work there happening. Um, and then for Emily, I was, I was really taken by um, transactional, and I'm just wondering what Tra how transaction is like or unlike other structures of exchange that you talk about, um, contract, uh, slavery, sex, uh, otherwise, and I'm just, is it an exceptional category? Do you want more qualified categories um, when it comes to something like transaction? Can I? Okay. So uh, thank you both for uh, two really interesting papers. I think my question is for Emily, and it's a bit of a follow-up from what Tina was asking earlier, and, and also you, Palomi. Um, so what you, you said at the beginning of your talk that you were interested in sort of creating these right now very delicate threads between two or more areas. And, and so what I'm hearing is in particular, what you're trying to figure out is the violence of slavery and the violence of prostitution. Um, or, or a certain, yes, I mean, uh, rape, but, but also, but that you want to try to figure out the relationship between sexual and racial violence by looking at pro the dis dis debates around prostitution, if I'm understanding what you're doing there. And um, so I, I guess I would like to hear more about what, in fact, those debates around prostitution were uh, in the period that you're looking at. Because, I mean, the, the context in which I know it, you know, the, 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 the question is, is prostitution legal or not? You know, what kind of normative or regulatory rules is it being submitted to? And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about you know, context in which prostitution is made illegal precisely because it is a form of making sex transactional, right? I mean, that's, that's the taboo. And, and, um, and so how would that then play out in relationship then to racial violence? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you. Thank you all for those questions. I, I, think, um, I think I can kind of answer them as a single one or maybe a couple. Um, so Tina, I think your question about um, the sex of violence is such a good one. And it draws my attention to the kind of historical context that I've been meandering through lately, which, is that, which, which goes also to your question, Suzanne, about prostitution, which is to say, I think that when I, am trying to understand what's going on with enslaved women who are involved in, who work in brothels and who live as concubines in um, 19th century New Orleans who are involved in these transactions. Um, I find myself constantly making analogies and they're not analogies that actually reflect historical reality. 
So, and, but that's a, it's a problem that I'm really struggling to get out of. So with respect to the sex of violence, I, my impulse to use the gender of violence comes from the extent that I'm trying to understand what's happening in rape law for black women, which is that they're not covered by it, and so they're turning to civil law, really, to try to get more free. And um, in order to, un to the extent that rape law only um, covers white women, um, I've been trying to understand the ways that black women are feminized in the face of the court and in the context of the violence that they're experiencing by looking at the other ways that the law um, engages with femininity, which is to say with gender, with women, right? So the ways that, um, uh, that white women become more endangered inside their homes and outside of their homes over the course of the 19th century, that, you know, thinking about uh, domestic violence and these other sites. But anyway, the point is that I think the turn to sex is really important and that, um, and so I, I am really grateful for that um, invitation. Um, particularly because of prostitution. And so here's the piece where I think my investigations so far have not actually reflected historical reality, which is that in New Orleans in the 19th century, all kind of people were, were working in brothels. And so my, 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 the structure of thinking gender is to think white women, black women, we're all together in these brothels, but actually I think that sex itself disaggregated race in some meaningful ways and disaggregated I don't know if it's disaggregated gender, but the point is that um, I think that 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 I keep making this analogy to prostitution, as though the the women who, as though prostitution is meaningfully marked as white, and I'm not sure actually that it is because the women who are staffing the brothels are all kinds of people, and so anyway, the point is that the analogy is is it doesn't work. Um, Tina. <laughs> I just have a follow up, which is that um, that it also sounds like it also seems like talking about the sex of violence mm -hmm. would help you to actually fold in a different kind of sexual abuse and assault, which you gestured toward when you're talking about prostitution, which is labor, right? And and that's that's the thing is that if we're, when we're talking about you know domestic service, right, and domestic labor, that is a kind of transactional. Um, process in which black women were more vulnerable than white women working, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that kind of allows you to, to connect a whole bunch of things that you're talking about. Um, and I just, I just feel like it's a really rich um, avenue to explore. I'm done. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> I, I just want to respond to Palomi because I'd actually, my, my response to you, Tina, is gets at this transaction piece. I use transaction because I think it's really broad and capacious, and um, I use contract a lot too, but there are lots and lots and lots of sites of exchange, and, um, and enslaved women are surviving, the ones that I'm writing about, are surviving largely by moving through different sites of transaction. So someone might, for example, um, start her life as, uh, or start, start a sort of world of intimate labor and domestic labor as um, like a nursemaid and then receiving good favor from the person who she, whose children she nursed would then be positioned in a brothel as a way of saying this might be a way to get you free even though it won't really be, but it might be. And so there's all of these different sites of transaction happening along the way and, and I think currencies maybe um, that that uh, the women that I write about are are de sort of dealing in. Um, anyway, so I'm using transaction. It perhaps could be the next political concept that's worthy of some. Yeah. So um, I would like to reply to Polomi, but I would like to follow up on this conversation. The question or comment, I don't know. It depends on what will come out of it today, Emily, in relation to the very beginning of your talk when you spoke about that, that when it comes to sexual violence or gender violence, uh, you have to qualify violence because it is not considered to be part of violence. And um, I don't know, I would like to share something from my work as a mode to comment and maybe to question when I did a work on Palestine 48, and I realized how many Palestinian women were raped by Jewish soldiers, and it led to the creation of the State of Israel. 
it's not it's led, it's part of the you know constituent elements of the creation of the state of Israel. And uh, then I worked on the uh, rape of German women in '45 because they were deser they deserved to pay with their bodies, and this led to the creation, or this was one of the elements that created the new world order that we know today. And uh, I had a student who wrote about the rape in uh, India, Pakistan. So it became clear, and I couldn't, you know, uh, uh, document it in the archive, but it became clear that political regimes, democratic political regimes, are made of or cannot uh, uh, materialize without the mass rape of women. So I had already uh, 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 two, three cases that I studied, and then came my student that studied India, Pakistan. Then I discovered that there is a lot of literature about it. So it became completely clear. And then I asked myself one day, and I think it was, you know, at the very beginning of my stay here, and I understand nothing about the history of the US. I trained myself in the last seven years, but I didn't know much about it. And I asked myself, but the US maybe was not created uh, uh, based on uh, a rape. And of course, it's false. It was created based on rape, and the rape that you discuss, rape under slavery. So coming back, Pulomi, to your question about over-determination is that, you know, the year of the Constitution of the U.S. is a kind of over-determination that tell us, you look around and maybe there was no mass rape at that moment. The question is how we think, and this is the work of Arata against this over-determination, how we think against this imperial temporality that tells us where to start to look at certain phenomena. For this, we have to free ourselves of the documents. Because uh, uh, even if the US was constituted uh, much uh, later than the beginning of slavery in the US, the uh, uh, mass rape of uh, 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 black women uh, under the regime that was here was what enabled this regime to materialize in its democratic institutions. So for me, the challenge is really to understand, and I think that you said it very clearly at the beginning, it's you find yourself qualifying violence, but actually you know that maybe violence in itself is uh, sexual violence or gender violence, or uh, I think that sexual violence may be. So if it, violence itself is sexual violence, and if we know that democratic uh, uh, state apparatuses are violent, so the, I think that the, uh, the way to look for not qualifying violence is to look in its materialization in the state apparatuses of uh, uh, democracy or freedom or whatever. So it's not really a, co a question, but I would like to hear you about this. And Colombia, hope that it's reply to your question. I don't really have much to say other than that's incredibly helpful. I mean, I think you're, you're, um, the, the example that comes to mind in the US is um, on the, at the end of the Civil War, or, or not at the end, but at, when the Civil War ended in New Orleans, um, the occupying Union soldiers um, under uh, General Butler said, well, Butler made an order that said that all of the soldiers should treat the women of New Orleans as prostitutes. That was his, that was his it's called Butler's Woman Order, right? So um, it's exactly what you're talking about, which at this moment of, of imperial militaristic um, conquest, this is what happens. And so, uh, my only, I, I think my response is, is that you're, you're calling me to reshape the question in a certain way, um, which is sort of, um, is there any violence that isn't sex, right? That, that doesn't include or really begin with sex and sexuality. So I think it's a great- it's, it's a materialized as a regime. Yeah. yeah. So Can we take a couple questions, Maria? So, um, Ariella, you said you're pushing back against historians, but I want to ask you to think historically for a moment, which is I'm really struck by um, the International Declaration of Human Rights happening at the same time um, as the erasure of Palestine, the Marshall Plan, the, um, the emergence of the IMF. They all happen in a, a three to four year period in the 40s, and so I'm wondering how we might think about that moment as a very particular, like maybe a nodal point to thinking about a different mode of, of state violence that might be, um, that actually accrues around the, the question of rights, actually. And so I'm just wondering what it would need to think about those things at the same time. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you for this question. So I think that you're right, it's a, it is a nodal point, but on the other hand, what I try to do in my book, that I address this nodal point, is not to make it too much of a nodal point, to make it exist in the span of 500 years. And not because I want to argue with historians if it started in 1492 or, you know, uh, 1478, you know, the invasion to Congo or whatever. It is really because uh, uh, the idea is to think about the imperial condition, the imperialism as a condition. And if we think about it as a condition, coming back to the nodal point, this is another re-enhancement or another materialization of what was accumulated. But looking more specifically about this, uh, uh, this configuration of what happened in 48, so it's also the UNESCO, for example. What is the UNESCO? The UNESCO is allegedly the cultural uh, preservation of the world, etc. So what I'm trying to do, and you're right to say that it is related to rights, what I'm trying to do in relation to uh, uh, the discourse of rights is uh, uh, to uh, uh, completely bracket this legacy of discourse of rights coming from the uh, revolutions of the 18th century, the American and the French, and then this nodal point with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and to look for rights elsewhere. And when I'm looking for rights elsewhere, it is outside of the documents. Outside of the documents is a document that will tell us that we have rights, but they have no materialization in the world except from one type of right. And I'm very interested when we are talking about rights to include this type of rights, which are imperial rights. The rights to write rights for others. This is the rights that is inscribed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Because this rights is an attempt to uh, erase the fact that there were many systems of rights. So what I'm trying to do in the book, Potential History, is to recover these rights in objects and uh, to see how, you know, people could recognize themselves in an environment of objects. And once their world was destroyed and their objects were uh, taken elsewhere, for example, to museums, uh, uh, the attempt was to say that this system of rights was eradicated. So rather than, again, recognizing imperials, uh, uh, imperialism as a successful moment, what I'm saying, no, they didn't eradicate these rights. These rights now dwell in these museums. So how can we continue to look at these rights inscribed in those documents and really uh, undermine the basis of the anti-immigration discourse, for example? So rather than looking at objects as something that now they want to tell us that should be restituted, like sending ambassadors of uh, modern art or out to elsewhere, not that I'm against restitution, but rather than accepting this as if the object is not a site of rights, to continue to recognize them as sites of rights. So uh, what I'm trying to do is to completely uh, uh, bracket this discourse that I study, because what interests me is how post-World War II, uh, 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 the allies that destroyed the world no less than the Nazi destroyed for centuries, uh, presented themselves as liberators and conducted uh, uh, lessons in uh, human rights literacy. They told people that they destroyed their world, what are human rights and what are violations of human rights. So I'm interested historically in studying how they implemented their uh, human rights literacy, but alongside the, the creating or restoring the conditions to understand rights the way that people understood rights all the time. So let's take a couple more questions, you, and then a couple more, and then that'll be our conclusion. Thank you both for the wonderful papers. And I want to return to the issue of the archives, because like Emily, I'm, I'm struck by it, troubled by it, but also I find it quite liberating. And I've been thinking about perhaps a distinction we may want to make between the archive as an authoritative institution, as the seat of the archon, to recall the here, and as a mode of imagination, as the archival imagination as, as practice involving materiality, but also creativity and remaking and kind of reworking. Um, so as material memory and as a process of reworking. And what I saw in your paper, Ariella, was that kind of practice. You were within the archival in your own presentation. You were engaging creatively and remaking the archive, but you're not outside it in the broader sense. So is it perhaps something you'd entertain as a possibility? Not the complete refusal of the archive as, 
as a, as a domain of action, but the archive as a, the refusal of the archive as an institution of authority as is being imposed upon us. And then it's like the top four, yeah. Um, so I w I'm very grateful to hear these two presentations actually in dialogue with each other, and I apologize, this is not very like well-fledged out thought, but um, I was interested in sort of how like belief value is working in sort of both of these papers. So um, Emily, with yours, talking about um, you know, this sort of movement, to, like this solidarity movement um, to say like, I'm with her, I believe her, and then um, Ariella with this like um, refusal of these um, qualifiers that are added to you saying that I don't believe in this sort of imperial rights that have been handed to me by the you know, imperial legacies that exist. Um, and I'm just sort of curious how, um, you know, on the one hand, you have this sort of like justification and validation of imperial rights via these documents, but then also the internalization of these belief values, right? So like the boys feeling validated to access like this woman's body, Reese Taylor. Um, and I'm just wondering about like the tension between those and if we see this like sort of transformation happening at the level of this sort of belief value where like shifts are ha happening sort of at this level where like, um, transformation is happening from people sort of choosing to believe against sort of imperial rights and choosing to align themselves differently than um, these sort of conditions and states would, you know, sort of reward them for. Yeah. Thank you. Behind, did you have a question? Uh, thanks, Rob. <clears throat> two, yeah, two extraordinary papers. I want to ask, um, I mean, Patricia asked uh, um, Ariel earlier to think um, historically, despite the fact that you didn't want to. And I wanted to ask you to think conceptually, despite the fact that you um, are fr were framing the concept of errata as a, as a practice, not as a concept. Because um, throughout your fascinating paper, I was thinking uh, at various moments about the degree to which something, a sort of um, a, simil a similar method, method to yours is also very prevalent on the, on the right. I mean, we have you know, historians like Neil Ferguson who write about virtual history. We have a sort of, you, one can imagine a kind of um, historiography that, that um, imagines that the um, Civil War, you know, was, was not, um, was won by the other side uh, and that the Confederacy is still around. And I'm, and I'm wondering if there's a way in which you, you might conceptualize your um, concept of errata in a way that would um, prevent it from being usurped by a potential um, reactionary history. And um, I mean, the concept may be imperialism um, that's running through uh, and the practice being errata. But I wonder if, you, if, if that's true, if that's correct, and that there may be some other way of conceptually underpinning your um, approach. Who wants to respond? I'm happy to respond, yeah, because <laughs> I will not remember everything. I already, no, I don't remember everything. So maybe I'll uh, do like my uh, colleague earlier. We, I'll go from the last to the first, and then I'll trust about my memory to renew itself. So, uh, Tim, it's very simple. I cannot prevent the right to do whatever they want to do. So if you ask me if I have any way to prevent the, the use of the right, no, I think that many people are using errata in different ways. And, but I think that, uh, let me come back to the beginning of your question. You told me that there are many people in the right that are doing this kind of errata, for example, saying that the civil war didn't take place or they continue, etc. And I think that coming back to Jasmine's uh, uh, lecture from this morning, uh, when she started her work of undoing choreography as a universal term, I think that only from the understanding of history as a universal category, you can say that even people on the right will do that. Because what they will do, no matter how much it, will, can, it can seem to you for a second, similar to what I'm doing, they are committed to the destruction of the world, and I'm committed to re the repair of the world. So when we forget about history as a, a universal neutral discipline, you cannot think about us together, even if sometimes they will use the same procedures as me. I think that the commitment is crucial. And I'll go back to Sharina's, uh, your question, uh, which I think can be answered from different perspectives, because I wouldn't think about uh, these documents by the state from the 
point of view of belief, but I, I see what you're asking. And I think that I was born to believe. Uh, my practice is not because I believe, hence I'm doing. What I'm trying to do, uh, uh, in a way, is uh, not to continue to believe to, to the interpolation that the archive uh, uh, has for me. When I, I saw this image of the Palestinian from, uh, expelled uh, uh, from Palestine, June 1948, uh, crouching, I saw it once when I asked the archive to give it to me, and uh, I wrote about it, and I immediately recognized in it this moment of resistance. But I came back to it a few years later, uh, so I wrote about it very briefly, and I came back to it because it haunted me. And I came back to it after I went to the archive, uh, to the uh, Zionist archive in Jerusalem, to look for information on infiltrators. And I remember going out of the archive horrified, because I understood the plot coming back to participatory fiction. I understood the plot of this participatory fiction in which I am participating. The plot is that I will now study the infiltrators. Hence came the infiltrator that doesn't exist. So the challenge of potential history is to uh, uh, make these categories uh, unfounded. Hence all these you know, monumental uh, uh, research of uh, 1492. To make it unfounded, I had to go to 1492. Um, uh, and then uh, 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 the first question, Yanis. So it's not a total rejection of the archive. And I don't think that you, will, you heard me saying that I'm outside of it. Uh, so it's not about finding a place outside of the archive. Uh, I do th think that uh, there is an archival imagination, but for me, saying imagination is not enough. The same, I think, as I, I replied to Tim. Uh, uh, because imagination, there is a very destructive imagination that tells us that everything is open, and for me, it's very destructive. Or there is a reparative imagination, and reparative imagination cannot reach out to the future, we have to reach out to the past because there are people whose world were destroyed so we have to repair with them, to be with them in this action of repair. So we cannot allow our imagination to imagine a completely new world. We have to repair whatever is here. So maybe in between your both questions, it is not about attending to this man and recognizing his action. It is refusing to see him being there before me as an already as a, an already object made for me. So uh, what I'm trying to do with the archive, rather than uh, saying that there is an, imagi an archival imagination, there is. I mean, we use a lot of it. But I would like to, to give an account which kind of imagination. What I'm trying to do, and this is what I'm trying to do with, with this image of trafficking of a person that were kidnapped from Africa, is to show the archival violence. Rather than thinking about documents as being dust, full of dust in the archive, in drawers, that we are, looking, we are going to look at them, to see the production of uh, documents, as, uh, uh, to see the moment when a document is produced that testifies that this man is, or this woman, are slaves, to see this as uh, 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 the performance of the archivist. This is an archivist for me. So I don't want to associate the archivist only with uh, uh, reading, with interpretation, with imagination. The archival violence consists of forcing people to embody archival uh, categories. So whatever will be our imagination, we have a lot of work to do in order to undo these categories without taking from the people the, the, uh, 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 the way that they were forced to inhabit these categories, but to be with them in the moment of uh, refusal to begin with to inhabit these categories. Thank you. And Emily, do you want to respond? Um, yeah, I think it's fine for Felice to say uh, very quickly. Um, I just want to clarify that I think we do believe women. I certainly believe women. Um, and that the practice of belief is defiant. I think that the, the issue that I'm trying to raise is that belief doesn't work very well because rape law has set us up to need belief and then to deny belief as useful evidence. And so, um, so I think, uh, yeah, so I, I think that 
that rape law with a kind of like long history of requiring and then um, undercutting narrative evidence is just, it creates a kind of, um, relies on amnesia about what we know the world is. And so that's my issue with belief. Um, and I think that one thing that I've really noticed in um, the stories of the women that I write about is that they actually don't rely on criminal law because they know criminal law doesn't care about them. They're interested in civil law. They're, they're careful and thoughtful about it, but I think there's a long history that's in parallel with the failures of the state to protect women of any stripe, um, which is that women find other avenues of repair and survival. And so someone like Recy Taylor, I meant to say, and I forgot to say, lived, did what women do. She lived a life. She had her children, she raised her children, she raised her grandchildren, she had a garden in Florida. Like that's what Recy Taylor did. And so the state in a certain way is irrelevant to what happened to her. And in another way is obviously the site of this massive injustice. And on that note, let's finish off and grab a quick coffee with a big thank you to both of our presenters and to the audience. Thank you.